no further ado, we're in a series, like Pastor Bruce said, it is called The Main Attraction. We're actually going through the book of Mark, and uh, we're noticing how Mark actually makes Jesus the center figure of every story that he tells. In fact, he doesn't even name himself in this gospel account because he is so concerned and wants to make sure that Jesus is lifted up. How many know that's a good idea? Well, to read our text today, I want to invite one of our deacons, Mark Weimer, to come on up to the stage. Hey, would you welcome him? And his cowboy hat. By the way, this is Texas. You know, there's a few, there's a few uh, guy, cowboy hat guys. Listen, Mark, when I think about you, I think about somebody who's consistent, somebody who's faithful, and uh, you just love God's people. And we're so grateful to have people like you and Adina and your girls uh, in our church. Uh, serving and loving our people. I can remember Chris and I, our very, very first week here at the Grace Place, Ellie was a tiny little tyke, and uh, you invited us to go to lunch with you and your family, and man, it just made us feel so welcomed and feel so loved. So thank you so much for what you do for our family. But not only that, our staff, you know, you are a champion of our staff and our pastoral team. So thank you so much. Hey, would you just uh, open the word and kick us off for the morning? Thank you, Pastor yeah. Sean. Um, I'm, well, we love you guys, and I'm honored to serve you and to serve this house. Um, how about those graduates, huh? I, you know, as bad as things get uh, in this world, I am, when I see that, I'm reminded that there's always hope. Open your Bibles to Mark chapter 2. We're going to start uh, reading with verse 23 out of the ESV version. You can follow along on the screen uh, or read in your Bible uh, and translation of choice. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He and those who were with him, how they entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Come here. And he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at the hardness of their heart, and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for your word, both the Logos that we just read and the Rhema that we're about to hear. Father, I just ask that you would take it and use it Lord, to change us and to make us more like you. Bless Pastor Sean. Holy Spirit, speak through him. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hey, thank you, Mark. You did a great job. Would you guys give him a hand? As Pastor Bruce said, you know, you get up here and you get a mic in your hand and words can be hard and you couldn't tell. Mark, you were a pro. Well, hey, uh, as we open up this entire chapter, it's, it's quite interesting as we kind of take a look at the text, but there's all kinds of things happening here, and here's what, really what I, I want you to think about as, as I get ready to kind of unpack this message, is that you guys are in a church, and we believe that God still speaks to us today. How many of you would just raise your hand and you say, God speaks to us? And you might in here be, be thinking to yourself, man, God would never want to speak to me. But here's some ways that he might speak to you today. There might be a moment in the message where you just think, that's really good. Or you go, hmm, 
that kind of hurt. Those are moments where the Holy Spirit is kind of just raising a flag, just kind of trying to get your attention. So in those moments, you might want to underline, circle, you know, write some things down that he might be saying to you because those are the moments that he is talking to you and he has something personal that he wants to say to every person in the room. Well, here in chapter two, there's actually several controversial moments uh, in Jesus as he's entered his public ministry and uh, the religious leaders do not like at all what they see him doing. In fact, they don't like the power and authority that he's walking in. They don't like that he's healing and he's, he's telling people that you are now forgiven. They're having a hard time with this. In fact, they don't even like his choice of friends. Uh, we also see last week, Pastor Bruce did an incredible job as we notice that they didn't like how the disciples lacked the discipline to fast um, I, I do want to say, um, Pastor Bruce, what an amazing job you did last week. Chris and I, uh, we are, are so uh, blessed that we can leave our church on a weekend and nothing gets burned up. In fact, sometimes people ask us, they say, who preaches for you guys when you're out? Well, our staff does. We have an incredible staff here, and a lot of churches are not blessed to have that. So thank you so much. We really appreciate you. Uh, your kids are in good hands because of our youth pastor. Well, here in this, in this uh, passage that we read today, there's two stories. And these stories are lead up to what I want to call the climax of this controversy. And the title of our message this week is The Controversy of Sabbath. This is kind of the final controversy of all of these controversies. And to make sure that we're all on the same page, I want to define this word Sabbath. Actually, we can find its origins in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Uh, it is the fourth of the Ten Commandments. And Sabbath actually would begin on sundown Friday all the way to sundown on Saturday. It was reserved as a day of rest and no work. And the people of God during that time, the people of Israel would give their time uh, for spiritual activity, things like gathering around the teachings of Moses, the Psalms and the Proverbs and the prophets. And uh, they would gather and they would pray. The author Wayne Mueller in his book on the Sabbath, he said this, he said, Sabbath time is not spiritually superior to our work, Rather, it's a practice of balance between the two. When we work and when we Sabbath, we actually get to work with greater ease and joy, and this rest brings healing and delight to our endeavors. How many of you would like to wake up on Monday morning and go, what a great day, I feel so rested, I'm ready to handle business. How many of you would love to feel that way? How many of you would love to wake up and say, man, what a great day, I'm ready to parent my kids and change some poopy diapers today. It's gonna be a good day. But when we don't have a healthy balance of work and rest, we wake up on Monday and go, man, another poopy diaper, you know. <laughs> Sabbath was actually meant to slow us down from the dangerous speeds of life. In fact, it's said that when driving a motorcycle at high speeds, even a small stone on the road can be a deadly blow to a motorcyclist. See, when we're moving through life faster and faster, we begin to outpace God and move at a pace that is dangerous. Uh, have you ever, like had something really small hit you and it like was a massive blow, but normally when you're in a healthy space, you can take that heat and it's no problem. When we move at a pace and we outpace God, even the smallest things in life can take us out. We're talking about the controversy of Sabbath. As we enter our text, I want us to just notice a couple things. The first thing in your notes I want you to notice is the reframing of Sabbath. We see this in the first story we mentioned. The Jews were very strict about their laws, and it's important to recognize that throughout Jewish history, the Jews find themselves in, in the habit of getting in trouble a lot. Anybody find themselves in the habit of getting in trouble a lot? You know, uh, don't lie, just look at your spouse and just be like, I know, I know. And, and, and the thing for them was that whenever they disobeyed God, they would find themselves under oppression. And it was because of their disobedience, God would send judgments of oppression and captivity on the people under the old covenant. But here again, we find these Jews, 
living in, under Roman oppression this time, and, and their scriptures tell them that a Messiah is going to come. And so they want to make sure that they do everything right. How many know they're tired of being oppressed, and they want to do everything right to make sure that when God comes, he finds them in good standing. So what they do is not only are they following God's laws, but they actually add tradition to the laws. Laws to the laws to make sure that they actually stay far away from breaking one of their laws. And so that's kind of the, the situation that we find ourselves in here in this passage. And, and I don't know about you, but I kind of don't blame the Pharisees for not wanting to be found obedient when Jesus comes. How many of you know we want to be found obedient? obedient when Jesus comes. We do it different than they do because we do it by the blood of Jesus. How many are grateful for that? We don't do it by the works of the law, but we do it by the blood of Jesus. And, and here's something interesting. In one way, the Pharisees' devotion to the law is actually quite admirable. But in another way, their devotion to the law is blinding them from the heartbeat of God. So the Pharisees could not believe that these guys, these Jewish men who were following Jesus, claiming to be the disciples of this rabbi named Jesus, would actually break the law in broad daylight. How many know that's pretty bold? It's said that in uh, the Northern California Bay Area, which I actually come from there, um, in the Northern California, I saw that West Coast, any other West Coastians in the house, um, there's, there's a lot of us, let's go somebody. But it's said that in our neck of the woods that if you pull up at a stoplight in Oakland or San Fran or some of these areas that if people on the street see bags in your car, they will break your windows, pull the bags out of your car in broad daylight, and before you or anybody else can do anything about it, they're gone, and you're driving down the road because the light has turned green and your stuff is gone. And, and most of us in the room would look at that, and, and it would outrage us. We, how, how many of you are outraged by those kind of stories? Like the audacity of somebody in broad daylight pulling off a crime like that. And that's kind of what the Pharisees felt like here. <laughs> They're like, in broad daylight, you're just going to like prance around on the Sabbath and you're going to like pull grain from the fields and eat? This was the type of rebellion that the Pharisees felt that they were up against. And what does Jesus say to these Pharisees? They actually come to him and they ask him a question in the middle of everybody. And here's what they ask him, they say, why do your disciples do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? I mean, they know all about the Sabbath laws. What's your problem? And here's what Jesus says to them as he corrects their heart in verse 25. He says this, have you ever read what David did? David broke the law. He actually went into the temple when he was hungry, and he actually ate the bread in the temple. By the way, the bread was reserved for priests, for the holy men, not for men of war. And David jumps in here, and him and his men of war eat the bread intended for the priests. How dare David? Now, I don't want to add words to Jesus, but as we, as we take a look at this, at this passage where David actually did this, nowhere in the passage does God rebuke David for going and eating this holy bread on this holy day. What's Jesus saying? Here's what I think he's saying. He's saying meeting the human need of hunger is more important than protecting all of your laws. See, sometimes in the name of protecting our laws and protecting our traditions, we actually miss out on the heartbeat of God. And here's the question I believe Scripture is asking us today. Are you clinging on to a tradition at the expense of, of meeting the need of somebody. See, God wants to use us on mission. And sometimes at the expense of holding on to our traditions and maybe our little add-ons of traditions, that we actually miss out on him using us. You know, there, there, there is a, there's a tradition that the Bible actually talks about us avoiding all appearances of evil. Anybody ever heard that one? And, and, and we actually attach a lot to that passage. And maybe even sometimes we, we take it to, where, to an extreme where we actually detach ourselves from the world. How many know the Bible says, do not be a part of the world? Yeah. That's, that's, that's a good thing to not do. But it actually doesn't say detach yourself from everybody in the world. It's implying don't act like the world, but be christ actually in the world, but sometimes because of our extremes, we actually separate ourselves from the world, 
And the God who is on mission, who left the heavens and the earth to come down into the world to love and heal his people, his mission can't even move through his people because they're not even in the world that he's trying to love, that he died for. Jesus says something really impactful to all of the people in the room that day. In fact, it's impactful for us today. What does he say? Verse 27. It says this. He reminds everybody as he as he reframes what Sabbath is all about. He says, hey, just so you know, the Sabbath was actually made for man. And, and you're making man bow down to the Sabbath and serve the Sabbath when actually the Sabbath has bowed down to serve you. Hebrews talks about Jesus being our Sabbath rest as he left heaven bowed his life down and died upon the cross to bring resurrection and rest and life into humanity. So he says this mind-blowing thing to people, and he says, God wants to bless man through the Sabbath, but you're missing it because of all of your religious rules, and you have lost perspective. In fact, you have lost the heartbeat of God. What is maybe a practical thing that Jesus was teaching them that we can maybe bring into our own life today? Here's here's what I think he was teaching them in your notes. It's actually about the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law. And sometimes we just get so lost in the black and the white and the rules, and here comes Jesus, and he doesn't say that Sabbath is not important. He's not erasing anything. He's just, he's helping to understand the heart and the spirit behind this particular law. He didn't even address whether they should or should not keep the law. He addressed the heart of the matter. And Jesus comes in this passage and he reframes their understanding of the Sabbath. We're talking about the controversy of Sabbath today. The second thing I notice in our passage today that I think is significant is in your notes, the reinforcement of Sabbath. So not only does he reframe it and help them to think about it differently, now he reinforces it. How many know that as a parent, you need to reinforce things to your kids over and over and over? Like, hey, it's, it's, it's Monday. Every Monday we take out the trash. Like, you know, it's just, just we gotta reinforce it. How many of you ladies know that there's just seen some things that us as husbands, we need you just to reinforce things over and over again until we get it, right? Right, ladies? A little amen. A little amen corner. I'm not gonna ask the question to the men because I prefer to stay out of trouble today. You know, I'm, a, I'm wise, brother. You know what I'm talking about. I'm smart. So Jesus actually reinforces his teaching on the Sabbath because how many know these people do not get it? So he says it over and over again so that they get his point. And he actually does something really, really bold here. All of these controversies starting in chapter 2 are coming to Jesus. The, The Pharisees are leaving from where they're at, going to where Jesus and the crowds are, and they're confronting him. And this time, Jesus in Mark chapter 3 is like, oh, no. He like, he brings the confrontation to them and he walks right into the synagogue. And the Bible, the Bible describes that the Pharisees are all watching him because they know that he's a disruptor of their system and they don't like it. So all eyes are on him. They're watching him like a hawk and they're, they're wanting to find out, is Jesus going to heal this man with the deformed hand? Now, I think it's important to know that in, in the law for the Jews, It was acceptable for a rabbi to heal somebody only, somebody say only, only if their life was being threatened and they were going to possibly die. So the Pharisees knew this man just has a shriveled hand. He's not going to die. So if Jesus comes to heal him, we know that we're going to catch him breaking the law. And here's what Jesus does in front of everybody. The scene is set. Everyone's all over the house. If we were doing a human video and a drama, we would have people all around us, Jesus in the middle, Mary, weepers, you know, costumes, headbands. I would be in a white white robe with a blue sash, and here would be the man, probably dressed in burlap, you know, with this shriveled hand. And the Bible says that Jesus, Jesus says something to the man. Now, he doesn't actually do this, but I can imagine that he he bent down maybe if the man was kneeling and put his arm. He says, he says, come here. And he brings the man in really close. That's a sermon all in itself. 
he brings him close, and then he looks at everybody in the room, and he says something. Here's what he says. The Bible says in, in, in uh, it says this. He asks everybody in the room, what is more important? Is it more important to choose life and heal this man or to choose death and just let him suffer? And the Bible says everybody in the room went silent. They had no comebacks. There was nothing else to say. What is he doing? Jesus is reinforcing his teaching on the Sabbath. He's making sure that they understand and they do not miss the point of why Jesus came and what he came to do. And Jesus' point, I believe, is this in your notes. It is always right to do the right thing. Hello, I mean, you know, that's like, that's not rocket science. It's always right to do the right thing. See, when we don't do the right thing, we actually do the wrong thing. It's so funny how that works. It's so simple. It's actually not complicated at all. And to this, Jesus looked at their hearts, and then he looked at our hearts. In Mark 3 and 5, the Bible actually says this, that he looked at their hearts, and he was angry. In fact, he was grieved so much at the hardness of their hearts. And here's a question as the word kind of gets in our business a little bit that I want to ask you today. Is there hardness in your heart that is grieving Jesus? You know, I think it's important to know that sin still grieves the heart of God. That might be a newsflash, a new news to some people, but sin grieves the heart of God. Why? Because sin hurts you and you're his, he's your father. And how many you know a good father's heart breaks when their kids are destroying themselves, when sin causes death? And here's the challenge with a hard heart is hardness causes us to miss the heartbeat of God. Here's what it looks like. You walk into a situation And because of the hardness of your heart, you engage in activity, you engage in things, and you do things, and it doesn't even cross your mind because of the hardness of your heart. Everyone else on the outside looks and goes, what in the world are they doing? Have you ever, have you ever, like, your friend comes to you for some advice, and you're like, well, what were you doing there? Like, bro, like, why would you even, like, put yourself in that situation to be tempted in that way? And, and they're, it's just because of a hardness of heart. They didn't, they, they didn't recognize it. They didn't know it. They, they, they weren't even aware. Their heart wasn't even aware. And, and the more dangerous thing is that when our heart becomes hardened like that, the next thing does it not only cause us to miss the heartbeat of God, but it, it can actually cause us to misuse the word of God. And we start start twisting scriptures to justify our actions and to justify our sin. And can I tell you something? Even the smallest sin of a little white lie is unacceptable to God. In fact, he came all the way from heaven to earth to die for that sin. Why? Because that little white lie is a seed of deception and causes confusion and clouds and disarray and ends up breaking up families and destroying your lives and destroying your relationship because it breeds death into a family and into a life and into a system. So God, too, even hates little white lies. As we close out this story in verse 6, um, something really interesting happens. It says this, that, that the Pharisees went out immediately. Somebody say immediately. As soon as he healed the hand of this man, they went out immediately. And what did they do? They had a powwow. They held a council with the Herodians. Against who? Against Jesus. And they were plotting on how they could destroy him. Here's what I notice in this passage is that I believe right here the healing of this man with a shriveled hand was like the straw that broke the camel's back for the Pharisees. This was the moment where they went from tolerating to Jesus to now it led them to the actual eventual arrest and death of Jesus on the cross. We're talking about the controversy of Sabbath. We first notice the reframing of Sabbath, and then Jesus reinforces the Sabbath. The third and last thing I want to mention today is the roots of Sabbath, the roots of Sabbath. See, whenever you study a passage in the Bible, 
Um, it's important to understand the context around it, and not only the historical context, but also the, the, uh, the current biblical context, and then, and then even the, the early church context, and even today, how do we look at it today? And when we take a look at Sabbath, we can know contextually what Sabbath is, because we can go back to Deuteronomy and find the Sabbath law when it was given. We could also learn about the Sabbath and the heart and the intention of it by taking a look at passages in the New Testament just like this. But we could also learn about the Sabbath by taking a look at early church history, our early Christian history. People like Justin Martyr or Tertullian taught strongly on the practice of Sabbath in light, though, of the new covenant. We don't do the Sabbath law like they did under the old covenant covenant to earn things to earn things from God to earn salvation to earn righteousness to do works but we actually do it because we are just submitting to the lordship of Jesus Christ he has already done all the work for us what are the roots of sabbath in the early church i want to just mention four of them in your notes for them sabbath was about stopping it was about a, a deliberate act of stopping, a 24-hour period of, of not working, whether paid or unpaid. Uh, this was a way of people resisting the pace of the world. It was a, like, if you, I'm, I, I'm imagining myself like in this stream with fish and turtle, kind of like the scene of Finding Nemo, and we're like swimming and we're flying through the pace of life, and, and all of a sudden it's time to stop. I have to actually go against the current and get out of the madness so that that I could stop and slow down. People like Chick-fil-A and B&H Photo out of the East Coast, they actually only have a six-day work week. They, they Sabbath on Sunday. They Sabbath on that day. Nothing available online, nothing available in store. And guess what? They are the leaders in their industry. They do more in a six-day work week than their competitors in their industry do in a seven-day work week. Why? Because God gives us rest so that when we get up to go work, we accomplish more when we work from rest. That's just how it works. They were practicing things like Psalms 46 and 10 that says, be still and know that I'm God. See, the act of God, or excuse me, the act of stopping says this with your life. No words, but your life says this. When I stop, I trust God. When we don't stop, we're saying, I don't trust God. I must keep going. I must remain in control. Did you know that refusing to stop is actually a symptom of pride? Not only was Sabbath about stopping for the early church, but the second thing was it was about Sabbath was about resting. So not only do I get out of the stream, but I don't stop for just a second, like a, a stop sign. I actually get out and stop. I park my car. I get out and I actually rest for this 24-hour period. In fact, God rested on the seventh day. How many know we're made in his image? How many know if God worked six days and rested one, we should probably try the same thing? Pete Scazzaro, uh, in one of his books, said this. He said, when we don't rest, we do violence to our own soul. Yeah. Here's another fun way to think about rest. When you rest, the world actually gets a break from you. <laughs> hey, hello. The world gets a break from you. Look, from your interference and in trying to do all the things that you're trying to do, right? They get a break from you. How many, how many of you know that you need a break from the person next to you every once in a while? Just look at them and say, you need a rest. You need a rest. But it was about rest. And, and here's what, what not only stopping, but actually getting out of the car and resting says with your life. When you stop and you rest, you are saying, I am, I am, I am satisfied and I trust God as my provider. I trust him as my protector. I don't need to get back to work and strive and, and, and compete and, and try to keep climbing the ladder to provide for myself. But no, I could stop and I can rest. The Bible actually says in Psalms, it says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Did you know that sheep don't lie down in green pastures? They eat green pastures. And a shepherd would tell you that. But God actually is such a good provider and a satisfier of the soul. You, you could just lay down in a green pasture and not care about anything, knowing that God will protect you and he will provide for you. When we 
when we don't slow down to rest, we're saying, God is not enough for me. The third thing for early Christians in your notes, say, they, for them, Sabbath was also about delighting. It was about delighting. And, I, and I, I love their teaching on Sabbath delight. The Bible says in Psalms 37, 4, delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. I remember um, growing up and hearing about Sabbath, and I just, it was so boring to me as I would think about, like, but I'm going to just read my Bible all day and, like, spend all day at church and, and just you know, praying and reading and, I, I mean, i sorry, you know, that's just, that's just what I thought. And I, and I realized that for the early church and for, for the people of the New Testament, it was so much more robust than that. Sure, they gathered around the word for the teaching of God's word. Sure, they prayed, but they also delighted in the Lord. How many, how many know how to delight in the Lord? God has given you gifts to delight in him. He's given you gifts to refresh you. Things like your children are a gift from God. He's given them to refresh you. Your spouse is a gift from God. If you're single, your friends, they are a gift from God. And so on the Sabbath, they would pause to be with their friends and their family that actually refueled them and brought them energy. Uh, how many enjoy God's creation, man? Man, you get out in God's creation and it is just like, it takes your breath away. It restores your soul. You take your little feet off and you just get your little toes in the grass and in the dirt and you just hang out a little bit in the mountains and your, your soul is just refreshed. It's just amazing how that works. And so Get out in the outdoors on the Sabbath and enjoy God's creation. How many of you love food? Man, I love food. Man, I, I love me a, a nice cow. I mean, I just, I love me a good steak. I, I love, sorry if you're vegan, I love, I love me some carrots, you know what I mean? You get some carrots and some, some broccoli, you know what I'm saying? You throw, you throw like the kingpin of all vegetables and, and put some asparagus on top of that. And then you get some garlic, boom, and you just get some salt, bam, you just like throw it on there. How many just love new recipes and enjoy food? It's just, it's a delight, right? It's a delight to share something new with a friend. And so, so they would eat around the Sabbath, they would gather and they would have a meal together. See, to, to delight in the Lord is to slow down and just smell the roses, enjoy the things in life. See, to resist delight is to resist the very practical, simple gifts of God that he has surrounded you with. And sometimes we're wondering, God, where are you? Where are you? You're just moving at a pace that's so fast you can't smell the roses. You can't, you can't see. You can't experience him. So he says, slow down. And the very last thing that the early Christians did for them, Sabbath was about contemplation. What were they contemplating? What were they thinking about? Some of our early church fathers said that they, when they stopped and they Sabbath together, they were thinking about the wedding banquet with Jesus in heaven. And they were actually just practicing and imagining what that's going to be like one day. So they would stop, they would eat together, they would bring all the friends and family over, the cousins, primos and aunties and uncles and everybody, you know what I mean? And they would make enchiladas and fajitas and some rice, you know what I'm saying? Oh, Jesus, you start talking about food, this revival is going to break out at the Grace Place. And, and then they would open the Word together and, and they would pray, they would worship together, they would slow down and they would be with God. I want to close with this story. Um, in the book Hidden Wholeness by Parker Palmer, he, um, he tells a story in the Midwest. There were these extreme, extreme wide out blizzards. They would, and they would come really fast. It's kind of like a storm in Texas, you know, like you open the weather app and it's like clear skies and like two seconds later, like boom and hail. And it's just like everyone's running for their life. So this kind of storms would come like this in the Midwest and they would say that they would tie a rope on the back porch of the house so that 
when a blizzard would kind of, would come, they, they, they didn't have apps back then, so of course they came quickly. But when they came, they would, these guys would be working in the field, and they would have this long, long I mean long rope, um, and they would work out in the field, and when the blizzard would come, their only way to surely get back home would be to pick that rope up and just follow that back rope back to their porch. The blizzards would be so thick in the Midwest that it was said that you couldn't even see your hand when it would blow strong. And there were many people that would lose sight and get disoriented in the blizzard. They would lose sight of the rope and they would get so close to their home and when the storm would pass away, it was common to find people frozen and dead just steps from the back porch because they dropped the rope. Sabbath is our rope. Sabbath grounds us back to our identity in Christ. It slows us down. It gets us back to our home base where we can hear the words, you are my beloved son, my daughter. You're not a slave, but you're a son. I have bought you with a great price. I have forgiven you. It is who you are. You are righteous. You are holy. You don't belong out there, lost in the field, lost in sin, confused and upset and lonely. You belong right here in my arms, in the family of God. That's what Sabbath rest is for us.